Well, good morning. It is great having each one of you here with us today. We're in a brand new series called Idioms, where we're looking at what are those different phrases that we've all heard a hundred times? What are maybe some new ones we could add? What are some idioms that maybe hurt us because they've given us bad habits? And what are some idioms that can really help us? So in this series, we've been trying to see if we could fill in the blank. We've had some pretty easy ones. I'll start with some easy ones as well. How about this one? A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. That's right. Number two, a picture is worth a thousand words. See, it's just a simple, quick way to explain. Number three, an ounce of prevention is worth, yeah, something about eating vegetables, that's all about, or something, I'm not sure. There's other ones that speak about value, but sometimes they speak about values and concepts in kind of a crass manner, but they still really are memorable. An example would be, that was as easy as shooting fish out of a barrel, which I've never done, but it's very picturesque. That'd be pretty easy to do. Or how about this one? Stop beating the dead horse. Number three, curiosity killed the cat. Now, all three of those, you're not going to hear at PETA, right? Those are not going to be phrases that they're using very often because they got kind of that crassness to them, but they also immediately give you an idea of what they're talking about. Now, other idioms speak about quality. They speak about how we do things and the, the tension of how we balance time and space and patience. One example would be don't cut corners. Do quality work. It's not worth cutting corners on this. Or how about this one? Somebody's going on and on and on in a story and you're like, can you take the long story and make it short? <laughs> Please make the long story short, right? One other one might be somebody's late to a party and you say, well, I guess better late than never. Now, we have a lot of different idioms that relate to our body parts. Did you know that? A lot of idioms. That cost so much, it was like an arm and a leg. Or how about this one? Man, I was so reluctant to do it. I thought I was going to do it. And just as I went to engage, I got cold feet. Or lastly, you know what? I really decided just to trust my gut on this one. Now, Today as we talk about relationships and how these idioms speak to how we relate to one another, we're going to find two of the body parts that get us in trouble, our ears, we don't listen real well, and often, maybe not you, it is for me, our great big stupid mouth. Thanks for being here today. My stupid mouth has got me in trouble I said too much again To a date over dead yesterday And I could see she was offended She said, well, anyway Just dying for a subject change Oh, another social casualty Mama said, think before speaking Don't filter in my head Oh, what's a boy to do? I guess you better find one soon We bit our lips She looked out the window Rolled a tiny balls of napkin paper I played a quick game of chess with a salt and pepper shaker and I could see clearly an indelible line was drawn Between what was good just slipped out here yeah, and what went wrong And oh, where she feels about me has changed Thanks for playing, try again Mama said, think before speaking No filter in my head Oh, what's a boy to do? I guess you better find one I'm never speaking up again It only hurts me I'd rather be a mystery me. Oh, I'm never 
started speaking up again Starting now Starting now One more thing Why is it my fault? So maybe I try too hard But it's all because of this desire I just want to be liked I want to be funny Looks like the joke's on me Yeah, so call me Captain Backfire up again I'm never speaking up again I'm never speaking up again starting now starting now well I don't know if your mouth has ever gotten you in trouble it's a weekly or daily occurrence for me. We're going to talk about that and specifically kind of how we listen. You know, we began a few weeks ago about how we calculate joy in every circumstance. The same thing's true when someone listens. You know, your son, your daughter, an employee, a boss. You say, hey, what's going on? You can tell something's not going on and they begin to share something that's going on. And before you are curious, ask questions, dig into it, Almost immediately, they say something, use a certain tone, um, say it in a certain way that, I don't know about you, but I immediately begin to be defensive. And something in me has an idiom. I say, I can't believe they said that to me. Right? I may not even fully understand what they're saying, but I immediately counterbalance whatever they're saying with, how dare you speak that to me? I can't believe it. Or... They begin to explain, no, no, that's not what I meant. Here's what I really meant. Here's what's really going on. And they're trying to explain it. And I say, yeah, yeah, I know what you said. But I know what you really meant, right? We, the all-seeing ones, even though they're clarifying they did not mean that, we know what they really meant. And so we don't hear what was intended. We only hear what we think we discerned. Other times, as they're trying to explain, no, here's what's going on, they're right in the middle of explaining, no, this happened, I did use the wrong word, I really meant to say, and we say something like this, let me cut you off right there, right? So we, we, like, we got these phrases from our parents, from other people's conversation, we didn't have great modeling of hearing come our way, instead we use phrases like that. And sometimes we get angry because before we've understood and weighed what they're saying, what we've really said is, how dare you speak to me? I know what you meant. And lastly, I don't have to put up with this. So these phrases, these idioms, I know what they meant. No, we don't. I know what they're really saying. Maybe, maybe not. Let me cut you off right there. How dare you say that to me? I want to give you a new idiom for every relationship in your life. It comes out of a letter written in the... Uh, in the Bible, Jesus' brother is writing this to fellow people about how to have the best marriages, the best life. We began this series with Count It All Joy. Last week, we looked at pursue wisdom from above. Today, the idiom is be swift to hear, be slow to anger. And if this sign had been longer, we'd fit the whole thing on there. <laughs> be swift to hear, be slow to speak, and slow to anger. Imagine how much better our marriages might be, our interdivisional conflict might be at work, if people were swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. In a peer-reviewed article, they shared the benefits of being a good listener. Here's what the peer-reviewed article found. Listening is an effective strategy for increasing one's perceived relational value. People are attracted to those who engage in high-quality listening. You want to be sexier? Listen up. 
Asking follow-up questions, a specific behavior involved in high-quality listening, increases others' liking and romantic attraction to you. Listening increases people's status at work as well. Good listeners are judged to be better at changing others' opinions, also better at building coalitions and maintaining effective working relationships. And yet, we're all bad at it, if we're honest. And we could all be better. So, what does it look like to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger? I'm reading a book right now called The Five Star Life. I was giving it to it by uh, Brittany. I'm going to be interviewing her in about six weeks here on uh, September 8th. She's going to share a little her story. If you don't recognize her name, she's uh, Jeff Ruby's daughter. And as I'm reading her book, I just can't believe how fearlessly honest she is about family drama, about pressure, about trauma in her own life, how she overcame it, difficulties in her marriage. I just, I called her up and I said, man, I, I cannot believe how honest you are. I really appreciate just the authenticity you're bringing to this book. And of the many stories she tells, she tells a story of her father, Jeff Ruby, who, um, read the book if you want all the story, but he basically falls out of a car. There were some rumors circling in Cincinnati as to what really happened, but he, 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 pushed, he jumps out of the car, didn't realize how fast it was going. He ends up in a coma. They don't think he's going to live. That coma lasts day after day after week after week. It's now been about a month. She's a little girl. The doctor calls in and says, oh my goodness, we can't believe it. It's miraculous. Jeff Ruby has woken up. So Brittany's mom takes her to the hospital. But again, he's been, you know, in a coma, not eating for a month. He's lost lots and lots of weight, looking like pretty scrawny. And his beard has grown in, just looks different. They shaved his head because of some things they did as they were trying to help him after the accident. And so she walks in with her mom, and she sees this scrawny, hairless person, and she's scared. And as a little girl, she says, that's not my dad, and she storms out. And, you know, her mom could have gone out and said, no, you go in there and say hi to your dad. That is your father. But she describes how kind her mother was in understanding her fears, understanding her concerns, and saying, hey, honey, what's going on? That's not my dad. Doesn't look like dad. Guy doesn't have any hair. She says, well, tell you what, let's just calm down for a little bit, and then how about we try it again, and, and I'll walk with you this time. Okay. And just how her mom really entered in, was swift to understand where she was coming from, didn't dismiss her pain as an eight-year-old, then walked her back in. She's kind of carefully walking back in, seeing her dad. And he recognizes her. And he's trying to be careful too, doesn't want to scare her. And she comes over, and as she gets a little closer, he says, hi, honey. She said, he wrapped his arm around me, and suddenly I, I could feel it was my father. Even though all that damage and all the, the differences that he looked. And it was my mom's great listening for me that helped me in that moment and even my dad, the way he approached me is so kind and understanding the fears of a little girl. What would it look like for all of us not to dismiss whether it's the concerns of an 8-year-old or an 18-year-old or a 68-year-old? A, a How could we be better at this? I want to walk through all three parts of that. So the first part is what does it look like to be swift to hear? So here's what James is writing. So again, it's, this book is so fascinating because Jesus' brother James writes it. He did not believe in Jesus. It was his brother, for crying out loud, until Jesus was raised from the dead. His brother's like, oh my goodness, my brother is God? So this is a pretty stunning book written by a pretty stunning circumstance. And James says, hey, my beloved brethren, all of us who are followers of Jesus, we're part of a family. And if we want to be part of a family, one of the things you need to do and practice is let every man be swift to hear. And the word used in Greek, before it was translated into English for swift, is run toward, speedily, uh, quickly, to attend to. It's the idea, instead of saying, oh, my wife wants me to listen again, oh, my son goes on and on about these stories, which I had a son who had ADD, and I, I heard about every YouTube video he'd ever watched in depth for hours sometimes. But instead of like being dragged to listening, what would it look like for us to rush toward, be swift to say, hey, what's going on? I care about you. I want to know what's happening in your soul. What, what if somebody cared enough about us to be swift to move toward us and wanting to know what's going on? Now, the word here is pretty important too. 
So we think in our culture that hear means the sound waves from your voice made it to my ear. I heard you while I was on my phone, while I was watching TV, right? We think hearing is the noise made it into our eardrums. But in the Bible, that's not the case. The word hear means, I wrote it here, it means to attend to, to consider, and get this phrase, to perceive what was intended. Which means when somebody says something, you might have heard X, but it's not what they intended. And before you make conclusions or react or get mad, you're going to clarify what was intended before you react. How much time would we all have saved ourselves if we had taken a moment to perceive what was intended, not what we thought we heard, right? So this happens in a lot of ways. So I was talking with a couple recently, and they were going through a challenge, and they were trying to make a decision they disagreed on pretty heavily. And they asked me to meet with them, and as I met with them, they talked for a little bit, and she would make a point. He goes, yeah, I, I know that you've said that before, blah, 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 blah. And she would say, yeah, I know that, but you said that before. And so they kind of looked at me, you know, what are you going to do about this? <laughs> I said, well, are you guys open to some feedback? And they said, yeah. I said, I don't think you're hearing each other. And both of them said, I know exactly what he said. I said, I, you do know what they said, but I'm not sure you know how deeply they mean it and why it's so important to them. Just for a moment, let's decide, we, let's pretend we don't need to make that decision. We're just going to talk about why we feel what we feel about the decision. I said, if you don't mind, I'll listen to your wife as if I'm you and just show you what it looks like to be curious and ask some questions. And so I did. I asked some questions. A little bit deeper, we began to understand there's a real backstory to why this is so important. And then I said, now can I do the same? Can, can I be a listener to him playing you? Yeah. And so I asked him, and we get to find out, man, he really was trying to do what's best for the family. He felt really strongly this is a way that he could prepare them for the, the present and the future. And, and that these compromises, though important, and may have to do it, he felt like it would take them off track to what would be best for their family long term. I said, do you realize how deeply he felt about this? I don't think I did. I said, no, I don't know what decision you're going to make, but I want to make sure you don't miss each other's hearts in the midst of this. I know the guy was talking to he and his wife, and his wife was very anxious by her own admission. Got very nervous and very anxious. And so every time she would speak, when we were, the three of us were talking together, he'd say, let's calm down, let's calm down, let's calm down. He's always telling her to calm down. Women love it when you tell them to calm down. And I, I paused him for a second. I said, I think you really love your wife and really care about her. And I think you've seen her get anxious in the past. And because you don't want to be anxious, you're trying to help her. He's like, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I said, I want you to know I really appreciate your heart in this. And I really see what you're trying to do. I said, on the other hand, maybe the best way to help her with her anxiety is not to shut her down, but to actually give a chance for her to voice that. Can I listen to her for a second and do that? And he was really nervous because he, he didn't want to fall into a depression or other things that happened. And so we listened. And, and she did. She amped up as we talked about a lot of different stuff. And then as I mirrored back to her what she was feeling and why, I could feel, oh, wow, feeling validated or at least empathized with. I said, you see how sometimes you go through the tunnel of chaos in order to get to that place of peace? He's like, yeah. I said, so I want you to try and calm your own nervousness about her nervousness so you can listen better. He's like, oh, I'm going to try and do that. Or John Kirby, maybe you know John Kirby, our Connections pastor. Uh, John decided to challenge himself to be a better listener for his kids, for his wife. So he decided to read a book called The Six Conversations. And a bunch of guys in his Bible study group, he said, hey, I'm going to read this book. Do you want to read it too? That we could just be a little bit better at listening to and conversing with the people in our life we care about. Our employees, our bosses, our clients. And so they went through this book study together for a couple weeks on a Sunday. And John just told me at lunch last week, two guys came back and said, oh my goodness, I, I have new tools to be better at this. And just shared how much it was helping their marriage. That's one of the things we try and do as a church. We try and make tools easy to find. So John's going to do that again. Starts uh, next week, or August 11th. Yeah, I guess that's next week during the 945 service. If you want to come an hour early, just be part of a, a group of guys just learning how to be a little bit better. Just for men, sorry on this one. Uh, we'll do a women's one later. Um, but how to be a little bit better at listening and being swift to listen. Now the second part is not to be swift to listen, but to be slow to speak. <laughs> this is... If that one wasn't hard, this one's even harder, right? Especially when there are things that are said in certain tones and certain accusations, you this and you that, things that you know aren't true or certainly accusatory. It's hard not to speak and defend yourself, isn't it? It is for me. So how can we be slow to speak? Well, I was a pastoral major, but I was also a communication major, radio and television, 
And one of the images we saw constantly as a comm major is how communication happens. You have something in your head you want to talk about, a feeling, a thought, but you've got to encode that through language and through tone and through timing. And as you encode what you intended to say through your language and tone and frustrations, there's so much opportunity for interference. Then the other person listening to you has to decode that. And they're decoding that through what they think the tone meant, what they think that word was. You may have said something that wasn't what you intended because it just didn't come out quite right. And so the decoder thinks they heard what you said, but they just heard what they interpreted. So let me go back to that idiom I gave you at the beginning and and just encourage you why this isn't helpful. All right? When we say we're hearing, we're often interpreting. So we say things like, I know what you meant. Can I encourage you to not use that idiom again? I have never seen that idiom help anyone. Not in family, not in business, because it's not true. You don't know what people meant. You just know what you decoded, what you think they said. That's why good listening is often somebody says something, and then you listen and you say, here's what I heard you say. And they're like, no, that's not at all what I said. Well, let's try again then, because I want to perceive what you intended, not what I decoded. See, when I think I'm hearing, I'm almost always interpreting. So I want to give my spouse, my employees, my client the benefit of the doubt and make sure I'm getting to what they intended to say, not what I'm reacting to what they say. And then you can imagine why you're getting angry or upset, right? So again, uh, reading this book, Five Star Life by, um, by Brittany, and one of the stories she tells and a phrase she uses often in the book is there's always one thing about a person's life you know nothing about. She talked about growing up here in Indian Hill and just because her last name was Ruby that so often she'd be mocked on the bus, rich girl, rich girl, they'd be playing the song, I Want Money, uh, which her family actually knew the guy who wrote it, and they'd be singing about her and making fun of her and she would come home and talk to her mom and dad and they'd say, well, you know, people do nasty things and and her mom said this, there's, there's always something about their life that you don't know anything about, maybe they're jealous. Maybe they came from a bad family life. They don't have family that really is close-knit and care about her the way we do. But really, both she and her dad encouraged her to try and have some graciousness. In fact, her dad had been mentored by some young men in his life in a time that he didn't have a, a real straight path. And so he was devoted to helping young men. And so because he was helping young men in the community, there were all kinds of rumors that he made surrogate family or whatever. And she'd be like, Dad, what's all these rumors? He was like, you know what? You just can't please everybody all the time. You just try and do the right thing. And I love both those stories in the book because it was about graciousness. Maybe somebody's getting mad because they just found out they have cancer before they got on the road. What what if right before the meeting, the person who's irritated found out that they're about to get divorced? Before I speak up or shut people down, could I at least for a moment pause and say, could there be something about the person's life I don't know about that I need to perceive before I react? I got a guy who's doing a dissertation um, and a book now from the dissertation on leadership and how leaders grow, what shapes them. So for whatever reason, he decided to interview me. Um, So he interviewed me about a month ago. And he said, who are the people who influenced you? I mentioned several people professionally and personally. And he said, how about your parents? I said, oh, well, my mom was definitely a huge influence in me. He said, well, how important to you is emotional intelligence in just career, life, family? I said, well, it cannot be overstated. I said, I think my mother was an emotional archaeologist. He's like, I love that phrase. I said, she had such a way of listening when she should be reacting. I once came home, do not try this at home, it was not a good idea. I had been surfing on top of a car that was going 40 miles an hour and I was literally standing on top of the car in the, uh, whatever the holder is for the the car top carrier. I came home, I was so excited because I had been surfing on top of a car, I told my mom about it because we had a good relationship. Oh my goodness, mom, it's so much, what'd you do tonight? I was surfing on top of a car. Really? You what? And you know what? I tell you this. She entered my excitement for 10 minutes. She listened. 10 minutes! Inside, she's like, (laughs) 
10 minutes, she listened to what I did, and then I got, she got done, and she took a deep breath, and she said, now, Chad, do you realize how dangerous that is? You know, you're, you're 16. You, you don't really, you're invincible. And I went, yeah, I just put my life in Adam Thompson's hands. He was driving. That's a terrible idea, isn't it? Yeah, it's a terrible idea, and illegal, and everything else. Chad, could you promise me something? Yeah. Will you never do that again? You know, Mom, I will never do that again. And I haven't, and I wouldn't recommend it. But what I was amazed at is my mom's ability to delay judgment and listen in. In fact, those are the three aspects of listening that make great listening happen. It's, it's empathy, it's non-judgment, and it's warmth. Three things that Jesus talked about in his big sermon he gives. He says, whatever you do to other people, you want them to do to you, do to them. Don't you want somebody else to empathize with you where you're coming from before they make a conclusion? Jesus says, that, that's how we should treat each other. Delayed judgment. Before people judge what you're saying, could they just delay that and understand what's going on? My mom got to enter into my joy <laughs> before she gave me the wisdom I desperately needed. Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged. Whatever judgment you judge, you will be judged by that with the same measure. So what if you brought that graciousness to your conversation? I want to delay judgment the same way I'd want you to delay judgment before you perceive what I mean. And warmth. What could be more warmer than what Jesus says? Love your enemies. Your enemies? Pray for those who persecute you. Imagine. I mean, how many of us as kids, we remember saying, oh, my parents don't get me. My parents don't listen to me. Right? We all said that. Well, what if we go, well, then maybe I could be a better listener. But these are the components you need. Empathy. An eight-year-old's problems are legitimate to an eight-year-old. An 18-year-old's problems are legitimate to an 18-year-old. Don't say, well, when you grow up, you're going to have some real problems. That's not a good listener, and that's not a good idiom. Be swift to hear, slow to speak. And lastly, be slow to anger. What does it look like when we're weighing the circumstance and our reaction to it that we're going to be slow to anger? This is what James says, this little idiom. Be slow to wrath is the word he uses. He's contrasting. There's things to be angry about. But usually our anger is self-focused anger. How many of us had our parents say, you're making mom and dad mad? Might we all said that? Or had that said about us? That is a terrible parenting idiom. You're basically telling your kids it's their job to make you happy. Really? And then you end up parenting out of your own anger and frustration. Where I'm not doing this because it's good for you. It's because it'll be helpful for you. I'm doing it because you're irritating me. And again, I did it. Plenty of guilt to go around. But instead of having this self-focused anger, we really say, I'm angry because if you continue this pattern, it's not going to be good for you. If you continue that, that is going to bring pain into your life. And so I'm always disciplining or advising out of love. And even if I'm angry at the thing they're doing... It's not because it's irritating me, though that is irritating. It's not just because it's frustrating me, though it is frustrating. I'm not disciplining or instructing out of how it's irritating me. It's my concern for you. So I'm slow to wrath, which is that unjust, self-focused kind of anger. Because James says that the, the wrath of God doesn't produce the righteousness of God. It's not going to do what you think it's going to do. In fact, there's this phrase used in the Old Testament that God uses to describe himself. He says, God is long-nosed. Well, that's a weird idiom. Now, in our culture, we think of Pinocchio. So if somebody is long-nosed, they lie. But that's not the case in the Middle East where this idiom came from. When a man got angry in the Middle East, true here too, but in that culture, your nose would flare up because you're angry and you're spitting mad and your nose would turn red. So if you had a short nose, it meant you got red hot, flaring nostrils very quick. And God says, I'm not like that. I have a long nose. It takes a long time to heat me up. I lean into mercy and kindness and compassion and second, third, fourth chances before I get angry. So James says, here's how the Bible uniquely helps us with this resource. When you stumble in one area of the law, you've actually stumbled in the whole thing. You're guilty of the whole thing. Which doesn't seem to ring true. Saying, well, just because I murdered somebody doesn't mean I commit adultery. 
What he's saying is there aren't like multiple laws of God. There's kind of one standard of God's goodness. And so God's goodness includes not stealing. God's goodness includes not being unfaithful. God's goodness includes telling the truth. When you stumble in one area of it, you've really broken the whole thing, meaning you're not living the good life. Well, that's depressing. Well, maybe, but it's also humbling because now whatever somebody is saying or somebody is doing, I've done something similarly stupid or inappropriate. So it just brings a level of humility to the conversation. It's no longer like me up there going, you shouldn't be doing this like my wonderful life. It's more like, hey, listen, I've struggled too. Let me listen. I'm not going to get too angry because a lot of people could be angry at me for what I've done. It just brings a humility to the conversation, which is why he says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Be swift to hear but slow to anger because you want to lead with mercy, not giving people what they deserve. And even when you discipline, it's consistent, it's measured, it's explained. You're not disciplining out of your emotion, you're disciplining out of your care and love for a particular behavior you're trying to change. So there's a, a tool I came across years ago, it's called Jahari Window. And I find it so helpful because it says there, there's certain parts of you that are known to you and known to others. That's your open self. I know I like uh, Star Wars. People who walk by my office know I like Star Wars. Uh, people, uh, I like to play sand volleyball. People who play with me every Monday know I like sand volleyball. Then there's blind spots. Things that are not known to you, but they're known to everybody around you. And it's very easy to help with your blind spots. If you have the courage to ask everybody around you to give you feedback. Here's a challenge. What if you turn to your spouse your employees, your kids, this week, today even, and say, scale one to ten, how's dad at being swift to hear? Wouldn't you want to know if everybody thinks you're a five? Everybody thinks you're a two? Wouldn't you want the affirmation to know it's a nine? See, you can't grow if it's a blind spot. What if you were to say, today, scale one to ten, how good am I at being slow to speak? Now, you know, sometimes you don't hear what I'm saying before you speak up. You know what? I want to work on that. Scale 1 to 10, how am I doing at being slow to anger? There's other areas in my life that, that are hidden. I know about them, the true of me, but other people don't. And part of what church does, it puts a community that says, you know what? I, I want to be bold enough to say, I struggle with this. My life's not exactly what I look like on the outside. I need someone to listen to me with non judgment, with empathy, to help me. Be become more of a holistic person. And there's some parts of us that we don't know about ourselves and other people don't know about ourselves. And that's where God comes in the equation. God, search me and know me. Help me to understand the best way to live my life. I was talking to a friend recently. <clears throat> He's been through just a devastating divorce, and they're all bad, but this one was 20 years later still financially devastated. And like with all divorce, the divorce just continues to mutate into deeper and deeper levels of ugliness. And so his ex-wife had pretty much told all the, the girls to not talk to him, that he was evil, that he was bad, and they've all, in one way or another, broke off relationship with him. And so he not only lost his wife, but in some way he's lost his family, at least at certain degrees. So he's telling me a story that he got invited to his daughter's wedding. He could at least attend. And at the wedding rehearsal, uh, they had a dinner, and he was glad to at least be invited. That was a step from where they'd been. And she got up with her new husband and said, now, we're followers of Jesus, and one of the things that's most important to us is love. She says, here's what we try and live our life by. And she pulls out 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not seek its own. And he's sitting, he got remarried three years ago. He's like, my jaw dropped. Like, that's your mission in life? That's how you try to why don't you show a little bit of that over here to dad, right? I'm not seeing much of that coming here. And man, he was understandably angry, understandably hurt. And I was talking to him a few days ago, and I said, man, how did you not just get spitting mad at that? He said, well, I am very hurt and very angry, but I realize this. I did the same thing to God. I poked him in the eye, didn't always obey what he told me to do, pushed him off and said he wasn't important in my life when he's the one that created me. I figure if God be, can be so patient 
with me, so slow to anger with me, I'm going to try and be slow to anger with my kids. I'm like, wow. So I guess I want you to think about this week. That's why Christianity doesn't offer just platitudes and idioms. It offers an engine to run it. That I want to be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger because I know personally that God has been swift to hear my needs. He wanted to hear about my need for forgiveness and he's willing to die on a cross for it because my needs, listening to my needs, running toward my need was more important than his own comfort. God is slow to speak. You think of all the things you've probably done wrong in your life. If God listed that all at once, I'd be overwhelmed. God is slow to speak. Hey, let's work on this. A little bit later. Hey, you ever thought about this? I haven't. Might that make things better? God just slowly, carefully forms us and works in us. And lastly, as I mentioned already, what you see in Jesus is he is slow to anger. Most of us grew up in church. We heard about an angry God and a mad God. That phrase, long-nosed God, comes from the Old Testament. Not the new. The Old Testament. It's not lightning and thunderbolts and God's all mad. No, God is slow to anger. In the Old Testament, and Jesus affirms that in the new, and we see that on the cross. I'm willing to absorb all the consequences of what you've done wrong because I so want to have a relationship with you. I'll invite the band to come out. And maybe you don't have that experience of knowing for sure that God is swift to hear you. It's hard to give away something that you don't have. But when you know you've gotten it from the creator of the universe, you're like, well, I guess I could divvy out some of that to my spouse or my enemy or my irritating son or daughter right now. I was talking to a business guy. He, he built this huge international movement. And he's running kind of from business meeting to business meeting, runs home to grab dinner. He's got to get in a meeting in about five minutes. So he comes in, snarks down some food. And his son's like, hey, Dad, i got to tell you something happened to me today. He's like, uh, okay, um, let me sit down real quick. I can listen if you talk quick. His son's like, nah, no. I think I'll wait until a time you can listen slower. This guy's like, oh, I just realized I've, I've paced my life in such a way that I never make time to listen slower. Listen, we've all made mistakes. God knows that. And God wants to not only forgive us, but also give us the motivation to go and to make amends. You might have the healing peace to somebody else's heart. How, how great would it be if somebody that hurt you called you up and legitimately, honestly apologized for what they did? You may not believe it initially, right? But you'd say, man, it would be so nice to finally hear an apology for that. In the same way, when you see what God's forgiven you, you say, I need to go make amends for my mouth or my lack of using my ears. This next song is one you're going to recognize. In fact, Tim was telling me he couldn't imagine we were going to do share at church, but here it comes. Think about the way in which our words in our ears have harmed people and how powerful it would be for us to go to them and apologize and make amends and say, you know what, I didn't do real good listening to you when you are in high school. I know we don't have a close relationship. We're in, you're in your 30s now, but I want to do better. Would you want to have lunch? And I want to be better at listening and better at not speaking. It's always time to start over. Think about that as you hear the words of the song. If I could turn back time If I could find a way I'd take back those words that hurt you You stay I don't know why I did the things I did I don't know why I say the things I say Try talking knife it can cut deep inside Words are like weapons they won't sometimes I didn't really mean to hurt you I didn't want to see you go Now I need you cry But baby if I could turn back time If I could find a way I'd take back those words Give them all to you Then you love 
torn apart Someone took a knife and drove it deep in my heart When you walked out that door I swore I didn't care I lost everything then and there Too strong to tell you I was sorry Too proud to tell you I was wrong I know I was blind How do we do? Some sharing? Is it pretty good? <laughs> that song, I mean, you probably heard that song on the radio a hundred times, but look how meaningful that is. What it looks like to make amends. Let me give you a chance maybe to pray and maybe to reflect and think about um, maybe those blind spots in your life or maybe that unknown area. Let's just pray that God might reveal to us someone we might make amends with or someone we might want to do better at when it comes to hearing. Let's pray. Father, we are not good at this. We, we react, we get mad, we get defensive, and we need your help. We want to be better at this. We want to be better employees. We want to be better bosses. We want to be better friends. We want to be better kids and better parents. So, Father, would you just bring a name into each person as we reflect for a moment? The name of someone we could make amends with. Father, would you encourage us to see how much you've forgiven us on the cross and to take that as the engine that motivates us to do better with others. Maybe in your own life, you just want to pray this prayer right now as we pray. Just say, God, give me the courage to start over. Give me the power to do better. I invite your forgiveness, your long-nosed character into my life. Maybe this could be a funny prayer we'll end with. Just say, God, grow my nose. Grow my nose as a husband. Grow my nose as a wife. Grow my nose as a friend. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, thanks for being here today. We appreciate you coming to our Idiom series. If you're new to the church or just haven't met us before, we'd love to say hi. Third door on your left is the hearth room. There's leaders there. There's friends there. We'd love to see how we can serve you better. Thanks for being here today.